Hello and welcome to lecture number 51. The topic is 5.9, Government Policies During the Civil War, and the theme is American and National Identity. The learning objective for today is explain how Lincoln's leadership during the Civil War impacted American ideals over the course of the war. The key concept is broken up into three parts. The first says, Lincoln and most Union supporters began the Civil War to preserve the Union, but Lincoln's decision to issue the Emancipation Proclamation reframed the purpose of the war. There was an evolution in his views in regards to slavery. In his State of the Union, Lincoln promised that he would not go after slavery where it already exists, but only limit its expansion. So how does he go from that to freeing enslaved people in the rebel territories? At the beginning of the war, Lincoln wrote a letter to the New York Tribune editor Horace Greeley, an abolitionist that had written to Lincoln asking him to take the war as an opportunity to abolish slavery. Lincoln responded in the following way. My paramount objective in this struggle is to save the Union, and it's not either to save or destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leaving others alone, I would also do that. Lincoln's reticence on acting on slavery had to do with the border states. It was important to keep the border states that allowed slavery as part of the Union. If he were to abolish slavery, those border states might have joined the Confederacy, and it would have made fighting the war much harder. As the war goes on, Lincoln sees that it is necessary both morally and militarily to abolish slavery. He issues the Emancipation Proclamation when the Union gets their first major military victory after the Battle of Antietam. The actual proclamation states, and upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice warranted by the Constitution upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. He frames his actions as both a moral necessity and a military necessity. The Emancipation Proclamation would hurt the Confederacy as enslaved people who were freed would no longer work on the fields or produce materials that aid the Confederate war effort. The 13th Amendment passed by Congress two years later would abolish slavery everywhere in the United States. The proclamation only did so in territory that was held by the Confederacy. That means that in the border states or the areas and territories that had already come under Union control, slavery was allowed to continue. The 13th Amendment would abolish slavery everywhere in the United States and it passed Congress in January of 1865. But Lincoln is assassinated before its formal ratification by the states at the end of 1865. Lastly, Lincoln's second inaugural address in 1865, Lincoln again frames slavery as the cause for the Civil War. Therefore, it is the reason why the Union continues to fight. Several weeks after his second inauguration, Lee surrenders to Grant, and shortly after that, Lincoln is assassinated by John Wilkes Booth at the Ford Theater in Washington, D.C. The second part of the key concept says Lincoln's decision to issue the Emancipation Proclamation reframed the purpose of the war and helped prevent Confederacy from gaining full diplomatic support from European powers. The main European power that is of concern is Great Britain. Great Britain's growing labor classes had always disliked slavery because enslaved labor directly competed against free labor and it diminished wages. Ideologically, the British also opposed slavery. There was a strong abolitionist movement. Frederick Douglass had been received by large crowds when he visited in 1845, and Uncle Tom's Tavern had been as popular in Britain as it had been in the North. However, the economic trade links between the South and Britain were so strong that Britain did consider helping the Confederacy to maintain its steady supply of cheap cotton. Britain first flirted with the idea of giving recognition to the Confederate States of America in the Trent Affair. It was an incident in which two Confederate diplomats were taken off a British vessel by the Union Navy. That British ship was called the Trent. Great Britain gets really angry with the United States for abducting these two diplomats from a British vessel, so the United States has to return the diplomats back to the Confederacy. Additionally, British shipbuilders were initially hired to make ships for the Confederate Navy. The Confederacy had a contract to buy ironclad rams from a British firm owned by the Laird family. These ships were heavily fortified on the sides and were steam-powered. If these ships had been delivered to the Confederacy, they could have compromised the Union blockade around southern ports. If the blockade didn't work, then the Confederacy would be able to export its cotton once again and exchange that for cash or weapons from other trading partners. It was critical that the layered rams were not delivered to the Confederacy. The United States brought it up with Britain and forced the British government to confiscate them from the private firm, and it ended up becoming part of the British Royal Navy. Britain eventually finds cotton suppliers in Egypt and India, therefore it loses its incentive to recognize the Confederacy or get itself involved in this American war. The last part of this key concept says, many African Americans fled southern plantations and enlisted in the Union Army, helping to undermine the Confederacy. 
When enslaved people in the Confederacy heard of the proclamation, many walked off their plantations straight into the Union lines. There were also free African Americans in the North who took the Emancipation Proclamation as a sign of greater things to come for equality and freedom. It inspired both groups to volunteer and join the Union Army and Navy, totaling 200,000. Despite the large number and the Emancipation Proclamation, black soldiers still had to fight in segregated units with lower pay. Despite all of that, they actually had a better veteran leadership compared to the state volunteer regiments. As they joined federal regiments, their commanding officers had better military training than the ones in the state volunteer regiments. People like Frederick Douglass were in charge of recruiting soldiers to join these regiments, the most famous of which is the Massachusetts 54th Regiment. As a result of their assault on Fort Wagner, a Medal of Honor is awarded to one of the soldiers, Sergeant Kearney, for saving his regiment's colors, or their flag, in the midst of an attack. Initially, the Confederacy tortured or killed black prisoners of war, but Abraham Lincoln insisted on the equal treatment for exchange purposes. The Confederacy changed their practices because if the Confederacy started to kill American prisoners of war, black or white, then Lincoln said that the United States would do the same. The largest Confederate prisoner of war camp, Andersonville Prison in Georgia, had really bad conditions with lack of food and provisions. Despite them receiving equal treatment, in the end, they all experienced hardship. The last key concept says, Lincoln sought to reunify the country and use speeches such as the Gettysburg Address to portray the struggle against slavery as the fulfillment of America's founding democratic ideals. The first attempt at unification was in the 1864 election. The Republican Party changes its name temporarily to the Unionist Party, or the National Union Party. Lincoln replaces his vice president with Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson had been a Democrat loyal to the Union from Tennessee. He's chosen to garner more support since Lincoln was being challenged from the presidency by General George McClellan. He had not been happy that he had been fired as the General of the Army of the Potomac, so he was later a vocal opponent of Lincoln and decided to go after Lincoln's job. In 1864, Lincoln wins the election, partly due to the military victories from earlier in 1864. He also had the support from the Union soldiers who were able to vote through absentee ballots for the very first time. At the Gettysburg Address, Lincoln visits the battlefield that had just experienced the fighting three months earlier. He dedicates a part of the battlefield to become a cemetery. He notes the soldier sacrificed for a new birth of freedom. This wording is important because it's signifying that there is a new chapter that has been created in the country. It's what the College Board's key concept outline refers to as the fulfillment of America's founding democratic ideas that we are now getting closer to the original promises of the founding documents. Lincoln notes the challenge to keep the government of, by, and for the people from perishing from the earth. That's what the war is posing to the country at the moment. He views the war as an existential battle to fulfill these promises that were made so long ago. We're going to finish up with more government policies from the Civil War that aren't referenced by the key concepts but are still really important. All of them are part of a larger pattern that is expanding the size of the federal government during the Civil War. The first one is the 1863 Conscription Act. Men's ages of 20 to 45 are now open to the draft. It was really unpopular in the Northeast. In New York City, there were draft riots and violence directed against African Americans. The National Bank Act of 1863 was passed to finance the war. It creates a national currency and allowed the government to control inflation through the printing of greenbacks. When inflation was high, the bank would print fewer greenbacks, and vice versa when inflation was low. When Lincoln came into office, he suspended habeas corpus. This is the constitutional right to be presented with charges if one is to be detained or imprisoned. The Constitution does not make explicit which branch of government has the power to suspend habeas corpus, but given that it appears in Article 1 with all of the other powers that Congress has, legal scholars were of the opinion that only Congress had that power. The Supreme Court Chief Justice Roger Taney tries to intervene through Ex parte Merriman, a decision calling for the release of a Confederate saboteur given that Lincoln had unconstitutionally suspended habeas corpus. Ex parte Milligan tries to put a stop to the practice by the Union Army of trying civilian Confederate sympathizers in military tribunals. As they were civilians, they were supposed to be tried in a civil court with more due process than the military could offer them. Both decisions rule on the side of American civil liberties and potentially weaken the Union effort to fight the war. Abraham Lincoln had a very difficult moral dilemma. Does he follow the words of the Constitution as have been interpreted by the Supreme Court and allow the Confederate sympathizers to continue to sabotage Union forces, or does he ignore Taney? Lincoln ends up ignoring Taney's decision, which shouldn't have come as much of a surprise to Taney. Taney had been Attorney General under Andrew Jackson when Jackson ignored John Marshall's decision in Worcester versus Georgia over Indian removal. Democrats who were left over in the Union were usually called Peace Democrats or Copperheads. 
They often sympathized with the Confederacy and just marginally supported the Union over the Confederacy, though they definitely disliked the war in Lincoln. A Copperhead pamphlet on the screen racializes Abraham Lincoln for liberating black Americans in the Confederacy, calling him Abraham Africanus I, posing him as a king and overstepping his presidential powers. The last group of government policies includes the Morrill Tariff Act, passed in order to raise revenue and to protect domestic industries. Before this tariff, the average tariff rate had been in decline since the Tariff of Abominations. The Pacific Railway Act approved the Transcontinental Railroad route that goes to California. Because it's passed in the midst of the Civil War, it's going to use a northern route. A southern route will be constructed later on once the reconstruction starts. The Homestead Act of 1862 gives 160 acres to people who were moving west and were willing to settle on the land. If settlers improved the land and stayed for five years, that land was theirs to keep. Finally, the Morrill Land Grant Act encourages states to put forth the profits from land sales into a fund to build colleges that specialize in agriculture and engineering. Abraham Lincoln had a jam-packed term as president. Even if he had not had to fight and win the Civil War to maintain the Union, he still would have had a productive presidency. His term expanded the size of the federal government dramatically, and all of these policies affect the country for decades to come. All right, finally, here is the recap. The Emancipation Proclamation reframed the purpose of the war. The Confederacy failed to gain international support or recognition. African Americans joined in the war effort by fighting in military and Navy units. Lincoln's Gettysburg Address has equal importance as other foundational documents. And the Civil War expanded the size and role of the federal government. Thank you for watching. If you would like to watch the next lecture, you can click on the video link on the screen. And if you're looking for more practice to help you on the AP exam, you can visit apushlights.com. I wish you the very best in all of your studying and look forward to seeing you back on the next lecture.